Hello, and a very warm welcome to the Insider Essay, your guide to living better. Join us today as we open up to living braver and meet individuals with unique careers. Step in the ring with Jason Fall and experience the extreme sport of bare knuckle boxing. Find out how Rian Zeff is creating world class sculptures out of sand. Meet a kiteboarder and entrepreneur making pro South African products for kids and pets. Discover how David Manning is preserving the ancient art of stained glass in South Africa. Learn how artist Dola Sapeta is giving back to the next generation of creatives. Hear the story of how one woman's passion for pooches has inspired a doggy hotel. See how Durban based hitmaker Kyle Deitch also has a career as a chiropractor. And be inspired by conservationist Paul Bartel's innovative solutions to a sustainable future. Bare Knuckle Boxing has a long history and is now starting to make a worldwide resurgence in popularity. Although still small, it's growing in South Africa, and SA Amateur Boxing Champion Jason Fall is an aspiring bare knuckle fighter. So look, bare knuckle is the purest form of, of fighting arts in the world. And uh, in the 1800s, many moons back in the Scandinavian countries, men wanted to see who's the strongest. And that's basically where it started. And today it's exploding all over the world as a mainstream sport. There's gonna be people that think that bare knuckle is two guys going against one another like animals. It's absolutely not. That's why the ref is there, to protect the fighters firstly. So that's where the differences come in between boxing and uh, a bare knuckle, is that the ref can actually stop the fight. Should he see that the fighter, who is the weaker one, is in too much trouble, he will stop the fight. In regular boxing, Jason competes in the heavyweight division. The strength and skill he has already developed are being adapted to this new focus. I started fighting when I turned 18 years old. I did it just, you know, just fighting to lose weight and just whatever, get some anger and frustration out. And I really fell, I really fell in love with it. Started fighting amateur. Yeah, I became SA champ twice in a row, two years running. And from there, I just thought, you know what, I'm going to take this professionally. Decided to go professional. And now I've got this great opportunity to, to show my skills in bare knuckle fighting. I'm super excited. It's going to open so many doors for me. I'm just, uh, I'm just ready and waiting. Going from wearing gloves and uh, yeah, just going straight into something without gloves is absolutely crazy. But I do feel like it's, it's a little scientifically proven that it's, it's a lot safer than, than boxing. So I'm super keen to just give it a shot and to see what I can do. Former SA MMA number one heavyweight champion and first degree black belt Brazilian Jiu Jitsu practitioner, Rico Hatting is a co-founder here at Reps. Okay, so for Jason today, we're going to be working on uh, sport-specific exercises. You know, when you do bare knuckle fighting, you obviously in a fight, so you need to make sure you've got proper footwork. So one of the stations that we're going to be working on uh, is jumping from one side to the other without pauses in between, so that he can make sure that he gets that proper traction for the bare knuckle fighting, you know, so that he can get execute his techniques and his punches properly, you know. So the other ones would be um, on the assault bike, as we call it. The assault bike is not your normal bicycle. It actually works a bit against you. So that's good for your anaerobic uh, you know, fitness as well. And then we've got the, um, the dumbbell uh, clean and jerk, as we call it. You can work with a bar, but when you work with the dumbbells, you need to sort of control and balance it as well. And we also bring in the sprawl, which is um, he takes his body all the way down, horizontal and up which really works the body. So it's not just standing and doing the arms, it's a whole body workout. And then this one over here, we'll do the kettlebell swing for explosiveness. Uh, bare knuckle fighting requires explosiveness. So you really need to make sure that you get that kettlebell and the swing through the hips, because all the power at the end of the day comes through the hips. Despite no gloves, bandaging of the hands is allowed within the rules. Being physically and mentally ready to fight is crucial. So preparing myself for, for a fight mentally and physically, I mean, traveling around from gym to gym for sure is, is something that, that needs to be done in order to get the best sparring, get the best coaching. Everybody can teach you something different. You can learn something from everybody. So I believe that traveling around and, and 
just getting the, the best quality sparring that you could possibly get is, is for me, what works the best. Mark Batolo Bachaj Kamba is a 29-year-old fighter from the DRC who competes in the EFC or Extreme Fighting Championship. It all started when I was 12 years old. My dad pulled me into a judo class. And when I got in South Africa, my first coach helped me to go into kickboxing match. One day, I got into the MMA fighter fighting and stuff. Then I would keep on doing EFC matches, but I didn't really enjoy the cage fighting. But now when I got into the bare knuckle fight, see if I can get some good results over there. So we're here for that. I enjoy this game. Also from the Congo, EFC fighter Didier Iron Man Nyembwe is intrigued by the growing popularity of bare knuckle boxing as a sport and a career. Uh, train. Every single day I train, and I train other people as well, so my training is, uh, I incorporate everything, crossfit training, cardio, obviously strength training, and uh, box technical, so I put everything together to be ready for a good match. <laughs> come on guys, come on, work, 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 work. Ben Aikafata is really uh, fun for me because it's bringing back all those old memories that used to eat to fight back in the day without any gloves back home, without anything, so now, Finding myself in the ring doing bare knuckles, it's awesome. So I really, I really enjoy it. Tricky, hands up, throw a left. <laughs> we uh, we tend to get in the ring a lot and, and spar and bash each other's head, but it's not all it's not all like that. It's five or ten minutes of the time we're bashing each other's head, but the rest of the time we're laughing and telling each other. It's it's super super cool. Um, our relationship is so close. Yes, we bang each other, bash each other, it's, but outside the ring, great friendship for sure. Capitalizing on the coastline, they head out to Bloberg Beach to continue training, using nature's sandy gym for resistance. Conditioning today, most of the day, we've been working with gloves, we've been um, to protect the fighters, so they don't get cuts, so they don't get injuries, so they don't hurt their hands. What we do is here at the beach, the sand is soft. Um, we eat the sand, it's good to condition the knuckles, to make the knuckles slightly harder, so when you get into that fight, your knuckles are solid, ready to knock the guy out. And then lastly, we come to the beach. It's different running on sand, it makes those legs strong. And if you can stand, you can fight. The future of bare knuckle fighting in South Africa is gonna explode very, very soon. It's exploding all over the world, in the United States, in the UK, in Norway. I'm excited to bring this to the fighters. Bare knuckle fighting, it might sound vicious, it might sound terrible, it's not. It's all about a sport where somebody can go there and prepare themselves for a fight against another man who prepares himself just as hard. And uh, after the fight, shake hands, have a beer together, have fun. Fighting is in my blood and it always will be. Jason Fall's diligence and passion for bare knuckle boxing has equipped him well to succeed in his new career. Coming up, Discover incredible sand sculptures with Rian Zeff and meet kiteboarding entrepreneur and Capitech client Michelle Sky Hayward. Many of us may fondly recall the buckets and spades we used to make sandcastles as children. But Rion Zeff has taken the art of sand sculptures to a whole new level. This talented artist has been carving out his unique career for the past 20 years. I did art my entire life. From grade one, I just loved tangible stuff, playing with my hands, doing things. After studying, I wasn't quite clear of what I wanted to do, but I followed my heart in the pursuit of art. And then one day, I was playing on the beach and it just unleashed my passion. And I thought, you know, this is something that's very unique and I wanted to give a go of it. And I just persisted and persisted and persisted. I never gave up after people telling me, yeah, idealistic, mate. And then uh, I started doing corporate work and the word got out and yeah, they were pretty amazed that one could do this with sand and still earn a living and bring joy to people. 
The abundance of sand means Rion is never short of materials. My office, well, can't complain, can you? People love it. They come in the mornings just to see my work and I can converse with people and elderly people who cannot come onto the beach and they get so much enjoyment from it as well. The Two Oceans Aquarium at the V&A Waterfront is an internationally celebrated tourist attraction and research centre. For Rion, it is a brilliant source of inspiration. Growing up, I was so intrigued with animals and life as far as nature goes. And this kind of place gives me that crazy cool inspiration. So for the sculpture I have in mind, I'm thinking of making a menagerie of different creatures, but all together in one little aquarium type thing. So you'll get an aspect of movement and their characters and what they're about. When I do a sculpture, I try and get a message across. Like, for example, the plight of the shark. I tell a story on social media why I've done it, which gets a message across. Uh, I love beach cleanups where I do certain sculptures and I utilize plastic and really strike home the message. Rion is regarded as one of the world's top sand sculptors and is sought out by some of the biggest brands. His process requires tremendous skill that he has mastered over his career. Basically, it all starts with one big mound of sand and I have to compact it. I have to go get water, saturate it, pack it, pack it, pack it. That takes about a good half an hour, 45 minutes to get it really, really hard. I start off with my sketch in mind and I see where I have to start shaping by packing the sand and just shaping it. No tools involved, just my hands. Cardinal rule is top to bottom and you play it like a chess game, that you know your moves ahead of time. This is a palette knife that normally you use for oil painting on canvas. For me, this is my most important tool. Once you master this, you can do anything. The most important thing when you are carving is not to be too greedy to know how much you can undercut it without it coming down. And that takes practice and practice and practice. And then it just becomes natural where you know how much it all boils down to physics, what can hold and what cannot. To any aspiring artist out there, hold on to your passion that you first started with and that you thought, wow, this is something I can do. Don't give up on that. Just persist and it will come to fruition if you believe deep inside that what you're doing is bringing joy. That's the main thing. Doing what you love brings a great sense of fulfillment. We wish Rian Zef the very best as he adds beauty and joy to our beaches. Capitec client and professional kiteboarder Michelle Sky Haywood has never been afraid to follow her own course, carve her own wave, or boldly shape the unique career and lifestyle of her choosing. It's an attitude propelling her to great heights in both her sport and business ventures. My name is Michelle Sky Hayward. I'm a professional kite surfer, social media influencer, and business owner based in Cape Town. I started kite surfing about almost 15 years ago now and how I got into it was that I was living in a small town in the Eastern Cape and I had been a gymnast my whole childhood and I had been doing a little bit of surfing but I was just looking for something more, something new, a new sport to do and my dad and I saw people doing kite surfing there and we instantly knew we just had to do it and it took us a while to really get into it but once we started I just knew that this was going to be my career one day. I knew that this was going to be something that I was going to be doing for the rest of my life. I started off by doing a lot of competitions. I was the South African champion at one stage, but then I knew I needed to turn this into something more sustainable long-term if I wanted to continue this as a career. And especially now that we haven't been having a lot of competitions, we haven't been able to travel. So I've been so blessed to have sponsors who just want me to create content for them, spread awareness of their brands, and that's how I've been able to make a living out of this and turn it into a career. So the different pieces of equipment you need, first of all is the harness. 
So I have a waist harness, which you'll see most riders are using as well. And then your bar will attach to the harness, which attaches to the kite. Then you need a pump. And a lot of people don't realize you actually need to pump up your kite before you can get going. So you'll see there are two different types of boards that you can use like this. So I like to use both just for fun. So the boots are a little bit more advanced because your feet get strapped into them a lot like wakeboarding. And you strap your feet inside of them. So this can be very dangerous because if you fall, then your foot is locked inside. So I wouldn't recommend this for someone who's not an advanced rider. And then you'll see most riders use foot straps like this because then your foot can come in and out and it's a lot safer. You'll also see people use wave riding boards, which is a lot like a surfboard, but I like to focus on these boards, which are called twin tips. I love coming to the beach any chance that I get just to check out the conditions, whether I can come kite surfing or surfing or even just go for a walk on the beach. During the off season, which is now, I find other ways to keep myself fit and active and keep myself busy when I'm not kite surfing as often. So I like to ride my electric unicycle. I like to go running. I like to still stay active and go for walks on the beach. And I love to work out in my gym at home. So my husband, um, Neil, and I absolutely love unicycling now. How I first got into it is that a friend of mine sells them. So he said I could just go for a demo ride and go for a lesson and just try it out. And I really thought it would be just something I'd try once just for the fun of it. And the moment I got onto it and started riding by myself, I just knew that this was something I was going to continue doing. And I knew I had to get a wheel of my own. My husband, shortly after that, also started getting interested in it. And we are just hooked now. Anything sports oriented that I really enjoy. I wasn't too keen when I first saw this thing. I thought, nah, I'm more water based. I gave it a try. I must be honest, after the first hour or two, I was absolutely hooked. So we go everywhere on these things. I really feel like the best thing you can do for your marriage is do something fun together. When life gets stressful, having fun and laughing together just makes all the difference. Being positive, proactive, and choosing the right partners like Capitech has offered Michelle the opportunity to grow in other directions too. I own my own business called I Choose South Africa. I started it at the end of 2019 where I felt like so many people were busy immigrating, leaving South Africa, talking negatively about the country where I felt completely the opposite. And I felt like if I really wanted to, I could live anywhere in the world, but I choose to live in South Africa. And so hence the name I Choose South Africa. What we do is we make products for kids and pets. So we make kids clothing and baby bibs, and we also make dog leads. And we are so fortunate to have a factory in the Eastern Cape that makes the real genuine shwe shwe fabric. So a lot of our fabric is actually made in South Africa as well. This is a product that I've been able to make myself, which has been great. And these are really taking off. And this is actually a snuffle mat, which is for pets, for dogs, bunnies, cats, any small pets. You throw treats inside, shuffle them around and let the pets snuffle for them. I chose to bank with Capitec because for me as a business owner, what's been amazing is their service. When I have to phone them, sometimes if I accidentally lock myself out of my account as we do, you phone them instantly, they answer the phone, they help you out, you're back in your account. I also feel very secure banking with them. They take extreme safety precautions. If you log in from a different computer or anything like that, you get notified. So you know no one is going to go into your account. So I feel very safe and secure banking with them. Banking with Capitec suits my unique lifestyle because it is such a unique bank. They make everything so simple and efficient for the user. They really do care about the customer and they're such a forward thinking bank and I really do feel like they're just trying to make my life simpler. If you would like help shaping your own unique career, you stand a chance of winning a 1,000 Rand cash prize. Simply reply to the competition post on the insidersa.co.za social media platforms using hashtag livebetter. T's and C's apply and can be found on the Insider SA website. Next on the Insider SA, travel to the Eastern Cape to meet stained glass artist David Manning and see how celebrated creative Dollar Sapeta is inspiring the next generation.
The term stained glass refers to colored glass as a material and to works created from it. In South Africa, artists like David Manning have made it their life's work to keep this ancient art alive. The craft of stained glass is almost 900 years old and is little changed. We have a few grinders and machineries these days that they didn't have in those days, but it's little changed in nearly 900 years. A lot of the public are not aware that these stained glass windows were made with mouth-blown glass. And the magical thing about mouth-blown glass is the artists will blow the glass into a long, almost balloon shape. They will cut the ends off, slice it in the middle, and then open it up in a kiln to flatten it out. Now, the magical thing is the artist who's actually blown the glass, his little air pockets would actually go into the glass and it almost his DNA is actually in that glass. So there's a real spiritual magic about the glass that's actually used in a stained glass window. After the stained glass designer does a small watercolor design, that watercolor design is handed over to another artist who will do a full scale black and white illustration. This drawing is referred to as a cartoon and is used as a guide by being laid on the glass where the artist shall work. This is a copy of a James Powell Whitefriar cartoon. Now a cartoon was used as the full scale drawing for the stained glass window. Every single detail was put onto this cartoon. The stained glass artist would put his colored glass, if I was going to do the face, for example, we'd cut a flesh tone glass, we'd take iron oxide and we'd paint the outlines of where the eyes, the nose and the mouth and the chin is. We'd take that piece of glass, fire it in the kiln at 650 degrees and that'll become permanent. We would take it back out the kiln, put it over and trace through all the shading with a second firing. The black thick line is the lead lines and every single piece in between is a separate piece of glass. And once all those pieces of individual glass are fired, all those pieces would be leaded together. David Manning was the first student at his Technicon to qualify with a diploma in stained glass. After his studies, he traveled to Ireland to gain skills working in a factory before returning home. The biggest difficulty with churches in the Eastern Cape is a lot of their stained glass windows are coming to the end of their lifespan. The lead in a stained glass window lasts approximately 100 years and then at that period it becomes brittle and starts oxidizing. It's at that point that we come in as restorers, we would almost have to duct tape that window together to stop it actually falling apart. We'll take it to our studio take a tracing of that window to show exactly where the lead lines are and then slowly taking it apart, put it back on that master tracing and we'd start with using new lead, we'd re-lead the window, solder the joints and once that's done, we would actually re-putty the window. David's company was commissioned to make a millennium window by a shipping company which wanted to represent its Italian heritage. Once the design was finalized, it took six weeks to complete. He works with a dedicated team here at this workshop. The thing I love most about my job is it's so varied. For one day we're restoring an old window, the next day we're making a lampshade, the next day we're designing a new window for some fancy house. Stained glass is truly a team effort. It involves me designing the initial design and then it'll be handed on to Martin to enlarge it to the full scale and do the glass painting. Sandili and Talani would cut the glass, lead up the windows. We would all get involved in the installation of the windows. So it truly is a team effort and I couldn't do it without them. I've been doing this for 21 years. I was lucky to meet David because he taught me how to do stained glass. And so most of the time what I do here is cut the glass and then let it together and solder as well. I think it's the love of art. This is why I'm doing what I'm doing. Painting on glass is a bit of a misnomer, I think, because we're actually taking off 
oxide that's been brushed onto the glass with water. So it's a very thin layer of oxide on the glass and that gets scratched off like you make an etching. Restoring windows, restoring old masterpieces, that's what they really are, and making a new window, for example, on the table over here, it's, they're both equally challenging and they're both equally enjoyable. I think there's great value in restoring these old windows in the Eastern Cape because they truly are masterpieces and I see it as a role of my team and myself to get involved in the preservation of these stained glass windows that we have something to hand over to the next generation. With passionate people like David Manning and his team, it's clear that the future of this unique career is in good hands. Mtolisi Dola Sepeta is an internationally celebrated South African artist whose work has been exhibited in Sweden, Nigeria and the US. This painter, sculptor and poet has dedicated a great deal of his time to giving back and teaching future generations. Well, like in my art always, I think my art is inspired by uh, situations, you know, where I am what's happening right now. So I spent a lot of time hanging out here. If you're sitting here, then you've got, you know, you've got the sea down here. And then you can listen right now. There's a lot of bed going on. So I thought maybe this is the area that is really dominated by those two phenomenon aspects. Everything that's have to do with the sea and everything that's got to do with the air, the beds and stuff. So I took the two and put them together and I named it Fishbeard. In addition to exhibitions around the world, his work can also be found here at home in places like the GFI Art Gallery. So these are part of the people that I interact with on a daily basis and somehow in them I see myself and I'm also part of the exhibition uh, I distort the images, as you can see them, that they lose individual identities for a certain purpose that's got to do a lot with my uh, proposed uh, subject matter, which is about the human condition. And in the human condition, I try to move a little bit beyond the physical appearance and deal with the emotion. Because my work is inspired by a particular community and you know, in terms of the future, where it goes, the, it carries the community with it. I think the community has got the work on its shoulders as much as my work has got the community on its shoulders. So at the moment, my work is right where my community is in many ways. The new Brighton Art School is situated where he grew up, giving him a personal sense of connection to its surroundings. Through inspiring others, he hopes to be like his mentor, George Pemba, whom he refers to as the grandmaster of township life scenes. Uh, we've got here Ayolile, we've got Kaya today, and we've got Pumlile and my daughter who are working in their different projects that I'm having a meeting with the gallery owner. We are trying to develop and kind of push the mentees a little bit further, you know, try to launch their careers at the moment to start their first collaboration into, you know, introducing them into a gallery setting. All the things that I've done as an artist, the exhibitions, the public monuments, the travels, I feel like this this is the greatest moment, this is the greatest gesture, this is the greatest breakthrough that I've done. Giving back to the communities, nurturing young, growing talent. What I've found working with these guys, I've found that they've got untold stories that the parents don't listen. People don't listen to the youths and I feel like I kind of give them opportunity and a platform to express themselves. When I was young, at the early stage of 10 years, we used to go at his house, me and my friends, to ask Dola to teach us about art. But when we grow up, my friends, they chose different parts. And then Dola told, told me to not to give up and push me hard and motivate me into getting into the visual art industry. 
one of my hopes for my art is oh, to be in the best museum in New York. Oh, I would love that. You oh, will be happy. <laughs> My work is it's all about the society and things that happen around my society. So I express myself to those challenges that I, I see outside there, you know. Art, firstly, to me, is a gift that I get from God. So gift is my career, it's my love. Okay, my hopeful future uh, is to see my life in a bigger picture and tell the people who I am, where I come from, and go to the places, see faces, bring back no cases, you know. With a mentor like Mkholisi Dollar Sipeta, a giant of the South African art world, these young hopefuls have a bright future. Coming up, spend a day with singer, songwriter, and chiropractor Kyle Deitch. And visit Vienna Village, a canine hotel helping support smaller dogs in need. For thousands of years, canines have been among our closest companions, but sometimes our doggy friends need help. Caring and capable Jane LaRue has built her unique career from her desire to assist animals in need. I saw a post on Facebook a few years ago of a gentleman who died and his uh, dogs had to go into a rescue, into welfare. And I knew if I, anything happened to me, my dogs would never cope in a kenneling system. So I thought fostering was a much better option and that's why I joined Cape Russian Rescue. We've got seven dogs and three cats, and uh, we started with Roxy, our Labrador. She's nine years old, and since then we just added on with little Dachshunds, a couple of which were foster fails from Cape Dachshund Rescue. Cape Dachshund Rescue rescues Dachshunds in and around the Western Cape, and we'll take in any Dachshund or any small dog. We're always on the lookout for foster homes because all our dogs do go into foster homes. Not one of our dogs goes into a shelter. So they stay with loving families who look after them and treat them as their own dogs. Especially in COVID, people thought it was a great opportunity to buy a dog and get a dog in. And then, of course, when they started going back to work, then the dog became an issue. So suddenly, we are now asked to take the dogs and find homes for those dogs. Jane's idea to start a doggy hotel was born out of a growing need to fit in more foster dogs, as well as to create a specialized home for pets to find a welcome retreat from the stresses of modern life. I found a lot of dogs being surrendered because uh, people were complaining about dogs barking and not knowing what to do with them during the day. And a lot of place people didn't want to go away on holiday because they didn't know where to leave their dogs. So I wanted to make a place that was going to be suitable where I would leave my dogs, basically. With most kennels catering to all sizes of dogs, Jane decided to specialize, offering a space where smaller breeds can come to be pampered. I just really wanted to create a place where a dog can come on holiday, like the humans go on holiday. So while you go away, your dog has a great time. So we created the, the splash pool with the cabanas so they can chill in the afternoons. We also have a little castle for them to run and play on. We've got little tunnels and a chill area inside, and they're not in a kennel environment. So it's like a home away from home. We also do overnight stays for dogs, short term and long term. We've got a little hotel suites. We've got 13 separate rooms with little four poster beds where the dogs sleep at night. Each dog gets its own little suite. For me, the main thing is a five star hotel for dogs. They come, they get cooked breakfast every morning. They have lunchtime treats and they are chilled with in the evenings on the couch. They have TV time before bedtime. So we just try and make it as loving like a home away from home. Jane wanted furniture and play areas to be specially designed for smaller dogs. So she had these facilities custom made. Jane approached us with a brief to design a Cape Dutch house that would be utilized as a dog kennel but be used as a showpiece at Vienna's village. It was challenging, but we decided to rise to that challenge and see if we could meet 
her expectations. I know Remy and Savannah are safe and sound the moment that they're here. And it's like they're on holiday. I don't need to worry. And if we're away or I have a business meeting, I know they're having the best time ever. All the little dogs that come here, they come back on a regular basis. And it's just like an extension of my own fur family. They all are excited to see us in the morning when they arrive and give us lots of love and cuddles. By expanding on her love for animals and her desire to look after them, Jane LaRue has developed her own unique and fulfilling career. After making a name for himself taking part in Idol's essay, Kyle Deitch has established a successful career in music. Catching up with him in Durban, we learn there's much more to this unique individual. Hola, hola, I'm Zansi and everyone back home, all the viewers. My name is Kyle Deitch and uh, I'm about to share one day of my crazy life with you guys and uh, looking forward to it. So come, let's go. Today we're going to be having a cool day where we're going to have all my different scenarios happening in one day. There's chiropractics on the go, there's beach soccer on the go, there's music on the go. So we're going to have a nice, fun-filled day, um, lots of activities and lots of energy. That must be the patient there now. Let's go see. Becoming a chiropractor takes six years and can currently only be studied at two universities in South Africa. My mom used to always go to a chiropractor and she, she would go like once a month, once a term. And you can feel it's a tight in here compared to the side. So I used to go um, with her and it just really helped with find like we we're able to concentrate in class and chiropractor is also good for kids with ADHD, a lot of concentration problems, helps decrease the irritation on the nerves and uh, helps to calm them down a bit. So you can imagine myself and my brother, we're always on the go, on the go. So this really helped to keep us number one healthy, but also just to keep the body functioning as well as possible. I see you got the one with the guitar. As well as being an award-winning chiropractor, Kyle Deitch has gone on to write and record multiple South African hits. Good love it. <laughs> turn it down, turn it down, turn it down, turn it down. Yo, so we at Beast Studio on the Bluff in Durban. This is uh, my boy Earl Evans, Brendan Johnson, his family name. And uh, yeah, he's a local, one of SA's many talented producers. And this is a space that we are fortunate enough to come to and be creative and work on new music. My parents introduced me to music. They loved music. We always had music playing in our home. And from there, I think that passion grew inside of me to create and always singing along to music, kind of maybe train my voice to be what it's like today. But then I learned to play guitar in high school at break time. I ended up going on a local talent competition and doing quite well, and then released my first single. It was released with Shekana called Back to the Beat. Myself and Sheik were friends and we went through to studio with Sketchy, who's a super talented producer. And Sheik was on vacation back in Durban, which is her hometown. And it was just a sensation of her loving to be back at the beach kind of thing. And that's how we interpreted it pretty literally. And yeah, that song just blew up and it was a great collaboration. Back to the Beach won an MTV Mama Award in 2016. Came home with the gold there, which was a massive one for us. Best pop song from the whole of Africa, which we were really proud of. Then there has been some summer nominations, I think four or five summer nominations. But the songs have done well and the interaction with the songs has, has been good. And that's more like an achievement for me, like having the response from the fans being so positive and being booked for big shows and opening for the likes of Biba and John Legend. Those were big moments. So it's more the fans and the performances and the interaction with you guys and the song releases than, than trophies and, and all that. These are nice for like, third chorus. And then you go up. I'm ready, I'm ready. 
Yeah. Oh, Kyle's got a dope sound. It's he's one of the the few artists in in SA who can bounce between genres. He goes through the trap soul vibe. He goes into the Afro beat, Afro pop vibe. He he does everything. I heard him on a house track that was banging. Like he does everything, and it's dope. It's unique to him. He makes everything like his own. No matter what you throw him on, he always adds his own flavor, and you can hear it's a Kyle track. I really I, I dig that about him. He's also a talented footballer who loves beach soccer. Growing up, I loved football. I ate, slept, and drank football. And my father, being an ex-professional footballer, really inspired me. And I think the disciplines that come with football really taught me a lot in terms of time management, keeping your fitness going, keeping discipline, self-discipline, which are some of the practices really important for day-to-day -day life. I think the most challenging part with wearing different hats and being in different careers is that you need to try and stay at the top and be on your A-game at every appointment, at every training session, in every studio session, at every performance. Yeah, so I think balancing those out and making sure you always prepared for each situation when it comes along. Got some really good childhood memories with my brother. Um, from corridor crickets to who can win the best fist fight to anything like that and I think Having a childhood full of competition with your siblings can be good. You know, the best development comes from good rivalries. And it's been awesome to have a brother that, that supports and loves. And that is vice versa for both ways, up and down, from younger brother to older brother. It's been really nice to have that, that input in my life. For me, living life is expressing this. I mean, being able to experience it in a way that's truly you. The earth has many opportunities and many different avenues and different paths for the, each individual. And for me, it's finding what that purpose is for you and really trying to go for it and achieve what is set on your mind and your heart. Kyle Deitch is a reminder that you don't only have to have one passion in life. With hard work and time management, it's possible to have multiple unique careers. Next on the Insider SA, learn about the future of meat production with conservationist and veterinarian Paul Bartels. Sponsored by Capitech. Simplify banking. Live better. Our next story takes us out to the Michalisberg to learn about how veterinarian and conservationist Paul Bartels and his team are interested in ensuring food security and protecting biodiversity in a unique way that challenges how we think about our role in the food cycle. Hi, my name is Dr. Paul Bartels. Um, I'm a veterinarian and biologist by training, and we're here in the magnificent Michalisberg area and in fact, this area was proclaimed a biosphere reserve a few years ago because of the incredible biodiversity that we have here, together with the topography, the vegetation, and of course, the culture and the history. Typically, as a veterinarian, you're working with individual animals. When you start working with wildlife, you're starting to work more with populations. And, uh, and then you start thinking about conservation and the whole conservation ethic you know, started growing. We're busy patrolling a section of the Michalisberg Biosphere Reserve and uh, looking for snares because typically poachers put snares mostly in paths like this. So by following paths like this, we have a good chance um, of finding something. Okay, so we found one lotion. Well, this is a snare that's been set for antelope or warthog. And typically you'll see there's this area here where the animal walking along this path will come along, put its head through, and the snare will then uh, catch it. And of course, then strangle it. Horrible way to go. So I'm really pleased that we found this one. You can see how it's set, and this can stay like this for days, maybe weeks, uh, but it's sure to catch an animal. And really, uh, it's really important that we remove these snares and keep removing them because it's only in that way that by taking away these snares, we're able to make sure that we keep this area of the Michalisberg uh, safe. Caring deeply about his surrounding, Paul initiated the Save Michalisberg Species Project, 
in partnership with Weso Wildlife Society and volunteers and students of the Tswana University of Technology's Department of Nature Conservation. One of his projects is a vulture feeding program. Vultures, and of course other species as well, wildlife species, are facing a, a number of threats. So, so one of the threats, for instance, for vultures is farmers putting out poisoned carcasses because they want to get rid of jackals because they think there's too many jackals, but it ends up killing a lot of vultures. So that's why we have to be very careful about what food we give uh, and how often. This work is incredibly important because here's a breeding colony of vultures and in the rest of Africa, the vulture population is actually decreasing. So it's very important for us to keep this vulture population going so that it can repopulate other areas once conservationists have sorted out the problems in that area. And we have to make it safe for them uh, within this uh, environment. Together with a team of leading experts in science and product development, they are working to provide healthy and nutritious cell culture meat to the people of Africa as part of the Meet Our Future NPC. One of the projects that we got into recently, and it, and it relates to the, the tissue banking that I've uh, been doing for a few decades now, is to collect samples from animals in the wild while they're still alive, and then to be able to actually produce meat in the laboratory, but not just the laboratory, but to transform and upscale that to uh, large meat production so that we can produce essential amino acids, uh, animal amino acids for our population. And at the same time, we don't have to plow up more land. Their innovative efforts have recently seen them being the only semi-finalists chosen from Africa for an X Prize, a prestigious award which encourages technological development to benefit humanity. We're at the lab in Biobank and I've brought some samples and these samples are going to be processed to isolate the cells from the tissue collected. This is where the tissue arrives and gets separated. The tissue gets chopped up and releases the cells. And from there, it's going to go into a tube, going to go to the microscope, check it out. And from there, it's going to go into the incubator. This is groundbreaking research that is necessary uh, for us for the future. So having a look at uh, what Marcus is now doing, he's looking at the sample uh, that has been prepared by Atelier. And the whole idea is to see that there's no contamination uh, within these samples and to take appropriate photographs and we then document it in that way. So these have to go into the incubator and then you can see when you close the door, it's got to be at specific uh, conditions, 5% CO2, 37 degrees Celsius. And by keeping it like that, mammalian cells start growing and we want to then grow them up into large volumes. So from there, it can go into a bioprocessing system. We're now at the biobank. So what happens here is the cells that we've isolated, grown in the incubator, have now been put into two mole tubes. They now go into the freezer here, which is at minus 80. We leave it overnight. And in that time, the cells uh, start freezing and we then have to get to a point where we go over to the liquid nitrogen room. And in this room, we have these tanks uh, and they're full of uh, liquid nitrogen. We have to take these cells eventually down to minus 196 so that we can preserve these cell lines. Uh, and in that way, basically, you can keep them forever. So when one then needs some of these cells at any one time, you can then take it out of liquid nitrogen, uh, thaw it out, and those cells are then alive. If it's for a conservation project, it can be used for that. But if it's for a meat production, which is our next big conservation stage, where we really want to get to a point where we can feed more people from meat made in a lab, but then scaled up in a factory type, we can have actually save habitat and at the same time feed people with animal protein. Many professions that today are considered unique careers are in fact pioneering efforts crucial to preservation. Paul Bartels is a forward-thinking South African whose work will have a positive impact on us all. Join us again next week as we open up to dreaming bigger and celebrate the theme larger than life.
Get more of the Insider Essay online. Follow, connect, engage, and be inspired to live better with the Insider Essay. Watch the show Monday evenings at 5.30. Repeat Saturday at 1 on S3.